Hi everyone. In this video, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the Juice DSP FFT uh, class reference. And this particular class, uh, the DSP FFT class, uh, is described in this page, uh, which is part of the Juice documentation on the on the website uh, on Juice.com. It's docs.juice.com. So as you can see, the class has a constructor and the destructor and these are the actual methods that are used uh, to perform the actual FFT. This function get size will return the number of data points that the FFT was created to work with. This particular one is the one I was using it because uh, I found it uh, used in the juice FFT demo version 6.07 in which I explored in a previous uh, video. Uh, but I wanted to when I looked at this uh, description, as you can see, it says takes an array and simply transforms it to the magnitude frequency. So I wanted to kind of dig, it, dig a little bit deeper into it. So looking at the full description of it here, it says um, that this uh, method is going to take a pointer to a 32-bit float buffer, basically, and this buffer is going to be used for both input and output. On the way in, the data that will be in this buffer will be 32-bit float values and takes an array and simply transforms it to the magnitude frequency response spectrum. What it will return is the magnitude frequency response spectrum, which means that it's returning also in the same buffer uh, real values, 32-bit real values. On the way in, it's going to get the raw audio sample on the way out, it's going to be 32-bit magnitude of each uh, FFT coefficient for each frequency. Uh, and the size of the coming data is get size. And the size of the going out output data is going to be also the same as get size. However, this function requires that the actual buffer that's being passed in should have double the capacity. So the size of the array passed in must be two times get size. I was curious when I saw this returning a mag magnitude frequency response. Um, and I, for my purpose, I really don't need the magnitude frequency response because all I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the result of this function to IM GUI and use the IM GUI plot to plot it. Now, I am GUI plot will normalize the data for me when it's drawing it. So whether I pass it the magnitude frequency response spectrum or just pass it the sum of the squares of the of each coefficient, uh, FFT coefficient, I am GUI is going to produce the same visual uh, plot for me. The data values will be different, but plot will be the same visually and I don't lose anything if I just instead of the magnitude I just plot the sum of the squares because I have the sum of the squares if I really need the magnitude I can take a square root of them on my own so I don't have to do it in this function because um, if I wanted to plot the sum of the squares I would have to square it square the magnitude in order to get the sum of the squares back to the sum of the squares to, to cancel out the, the the square root so i was curious is there any th any way that i can maybe look inside this function and see if there's any efficiencies i can gain by just going a little bit deeper into it so here we i'm looking at the simple fft demo dot h the code for that I've explored this code a little bit in the past videos, uh, but I, I'll take a quick look at it here. This code is under the Juice repo, under Juice, Examples, Audio, and it's in the simple fftdemo.h file. There's the method called uh, draw next line of spectrogram. It's in this method that the Juice DSP perform frequency only forward transform is uh, called. Now this 
Forward FFT is a member of this demo application. And it is, as you can see here, it's a Juice DSP FFT object. It's an instance of that class that we were looking at. And um, so what it's, what it's doing, this line has already received a new uh, block of data, audio data from the microphone. And it's already shifted the spectrogram image to the, to the left. In the case of the demo, the, the spectrogram go, uh, scrolls from right to left. So time flows from right to left. Um, so what it's done is, is already moved the, the image to the left, opening up a column on the right. It's gonna call and perform the FFT on the data. And then it's going to take the resulting FFT magnitude spectrum and basically insert another column to the right edge, right-hand edge of the spectrogram using the, the magnitude spectrum that this function returned. Since the input to this function is a real 32-bit values, float values, and on the output is also an array of same size, FFT size as they use it here, um, they, um, they're getting real input and then real output. Now, the code for this uh, function is right here in this file, juice underscore FFT dot CPP. Juice underscore FFT dot CPP is in the, under juice modules, Juice DSP frequency. There's this pair of fi files, juiceFFT.h and juiceFFT.cpp. The juiceFFT.h, which you can see here, is basically is similar to what we saw on the documentation page. This is the constructor, destructor, and the perform function, perform real only forward transform method, perform real only inverse transform method, and also perform frequency only forward transform. We can look at the guts of this method here. This is the guts of it. So what is it doing? After checking the size, it will then call another method, which is right above here, and it'll pass the same input-output buffer to it. However, the, this function will take in an input an array of 32-bit input values, but it will return an array of complex values. This is a different uh, function. It, it's using the same buffer, and that's why the buffer was uh, had to be twice the capacity. It's going to just basically perform the FFD, and upon return from this, you're going to have an array of uh, of uh, complex values. Each complex value, the real component and the imaginary component will be co-located. They're together, they're not split. It'll then cast the buffer to using uh, the juice DSP uh, complex alias. It, it'll say it's using juice DSP, juice colon DSP colon complex float. It's the same thing as a std complex float. So now it's cast the buffer to be a pointer to a complex. This out is a, cast, uh, is a pointer to a complex value. It's just going to loop through every complex value in there, and it's going to call std apps on every complex value in this array and put the result into the original floating point buffer. It's just the same buffer. It's just this pointer will not collide with this one because this will race ahead uh, as it's advancing uh, at 64 bits at a time, whereas this one is going to be advancing 32 bits at a time. But wh what it's going to do is basically get the magnitude by calling std apps. Now, this is std apps, but, and, and std apps basically just does that. Uh, it does a sum of the squares squares the uh, real component, squares the um, imaginary component, adds the sum, and then takes the square root of the sum of the squares.
And this is the part that I want to see if I can avoid because I, can, I, 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 don't have to, I don't really need the square root. In addition, what I s noticed here is that after performing this conversion to mag uh, of the complex value to magnitude, it runs through the rest of the buffer and zeroes it out. But in my application, I don't really need to do this. This is extra work that I can avoid. So I can un totally understand why this function needs to do this check. It needs to do this clearing out because this is a public API. A lot of people use it, not just me. But what I really need is really this much of this function because I can just as simply call this function, which is up here from my application. And then once the result is available to me, instead of doing the std apps, I can just calculate the sum of the squares. So that's what I'm going to do in my application. So I will be able to save this much in my application, and I will be able to save the square root uh, on every element, on every coefficient that's, that's done here. And frankly, I can also avoid this, doing this check on every frame because I know the size already. So basically my, the flow for me looks like this, and instead of std apps, I have, I have my own sum of the squares function. But while we are here, we're really inside the juice FFT uh, module. So let's take a look again, like a little bit more. What's noticeable is, okay, so from here, we go to this function right here. And there is this thing called the engine. And if the engine is a null pointer, this will call the engine. Well, it, this is intriguing, right? This means that juice DSB uh, class can actually support different FFT engines under the hood, depending on what platform you're on. And if we look a little bit closer into this file, we'll see all the different uh, uh, engines that they, they support. They do have a structure called FFT en engine, and this is Inside of it, it maintains a static list of engines. So this is a static array of engines. And this is a juice array. Uh, but uh, basically what it holds is a, a, it's an array of engines. So get engines will return that internal list of engines. And over here, when a new engine is added, they just add it to this list and then they sort the list based on uh, some sort of priority that each engine has a defined priority so what are these engines what kind of engines are there oh by the way there is also this which is create best engine for the platform so depending on what platform you're running when uh, you instantiate a juice dsp uh, when you're when you instantiate this juice DSP FFT, what it's going to do is going to automatically go and get create the best engine for the platform that 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 you're running on, and that's going to bring us right here. It's going to go get the list, and it's going to try to instantiate uh, each engine until it's successful. Once it is successful, it'll return that instance of the engine that uh, that was successful. So this create function, there's one of these create functions for each one of the engines. And if it can instantiate it, it'll succeed and it'll return that one. Because the array was sorted uh, based on some sort of priority, then um, they, uh, they can uh, kind of provide multiple engines that can vary depending on the platform. Let's see what sort of engines do they have. We know what the engine itself uh, uh, structure it looks like. This is the default fallback engine. This is the one that I've been using and the one that was being used um, by the FFT demo. This is a simple FFT function that it'll, it'll implement the, the FFT directly and it'll be available on any platform that the juice framework runs on here 
if you're running on a Mac or on iOS and in your project when you compile the juice uh, the juice module you said you want to use the Apple VDSP framework well then Apple FFT is one of the FFT engines that it can support on the Mac desktop or on iOS these are the functions that come out of the VDSP uh, framework that is from Apple. On the Apple platform, I would imagine that this is the most efficient one. But this is not available on Windows. It's not av available on VDSP. It's just an Apple-only engine. But on platforms such as Linux or Windows, even Apple, uh, Mac OS basically, where FFTW is available. That's the fastest Fourier transformer in the West, I think, or um, FFTW. There are two options. One is a, uh, a dynamic library, a shared library, or a static library. When this engine is being instantiated, if it's able to, its create function here is gonna look for one of these DLLs on the Mac, it'll look for this dilib. On Windows, it'll look for this DLL and on any other platform like Linux, including Raspberry Pi or the Jetson Nano, it'll look for this uh, .so. And you can install it, basically, you can install lib uh, FFTW3 uh, on the Raspberry Pi or uh, on any Ubuntu using the sudo apt uh, install. I tried FFTW3 and it found the right one and it installed libffTW3. I also installed FFTW3-dev just to make sure that I have all the other, other stuff that I could get for development. So um, in any case, I, I was able to do this on my Raspberry Pi and I was able to do this on my Windows. I didn't try um, FFTW on the, the Mac because on the Mac, I'd rather just use VDSP. If, if you're not static linking, it'll look for the dilib or the DLL or the .so and it'll go get the function pointers out of the uh, dynamic library and then it, it'll have them. It'll be able to perform those functions. So you, you really don't need to static link it, but if you static link it, it also works where it, uh, it just basically um, uses a static linkage. Um, this one is the Intel FFT. Its juice supports the Intel uh, MKL FFT libraries. This is another Intel FFT engine. That was the Intel MKL, right? This is the Intel MKL, which is the math kernel library, I believe. And this is the Intel performance primitives. So you have two different versions of the, of Intel FFT engines that are supported by Juice, depending on what you have available on that platform. That's it. These are the different uh, engines that are possible. One of the things that I did recently is to enable the shared FFTW. This allows me to switch the di by, by removing the uh, .so or the .dll for FFTW, I can just switch back to the fallback uh, engine and see the per which one performs better. This is some extra exploration in the Juice DSP FFT module. I hope uh, this is useful information again, and uh, hope to see you in another video.